calm is as strong as a spell. I'll never tell. Yeah, I like you, that's for sure. Hi guys, welcome back to Exmo Lex. Today I'm joined by my husband Brendan. I'm back. Today we're gonna to talk about Under the Banner of Heaven, which a lot of people have been requesting for weeks now. But we wanted to wait until the series was actually over before we sat down and talked about it so we didn't have to talk about it multiple times. So if you haven't seen Under the Banner of Heaven, it's a series on Hulu and I recommend just, you know, I mean, I guess I guess maybe you want to know a little bit more about it and that's why you're clicking on this video, but we're really more going to discuss like our feelings on it as people who once were members of the church rather than like tell the story of what actually happened. But basically, Under the Banner of Heaven is a series on Hulu that goes over a uh, true crime that happened, I think in the 80s in Utah. Um, and it was committed by men who were Mormons, but became more sort of fundamentalist Mormons, more interested in like um, the FLDS rather than LDS. And I think that, you know, they did, they were excommunicated at some point along the line. So maybe they weren't technically Mormons anymore, but they viewed themselves as following the true, the true Mormonism. Mormonism. Yeah. That's kind of the background of it. If you haven't seen it, I'm just going to go ahead and say right off the bat, I do recommend it. It was Highly really good. <laughs> That's a little bit of the backstory, but what I really want to jump into is more just talking about like, um, our thoughts on the whole thing and sort of like what I've seen other people say versus how I feel about it. And I feel like have as an ex Mormon, we kind of have a unique perspective because we can look at Mormonism the way it was when we were in it, the way it is now and be separated enough from it, not to be super biased in favor of the church. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's start with this right off the bat. Um, one of the things I saw people complaining the most about was Mormons don't talk like that. And this is, this isn't the way I grew up at, yeah. at all. Um, most of those sorts of criticisms came from current Mormons. And I think that they're comparing the way the people talk and act in Under the Banner of Heaven to the church today in yeah. 2022. Or and, even, or even in a different area. Right. There's a big difference between the heart of Mormon Valley and Salt Lake and even surrounding states like Idaho, um... Colorado versus like East Coast or, or other South parts of the world. or anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. And this also took place like 40 years ago and Mormonism looked a lot different back then. So there's certain things that they say and that, you know, they say heavenly father a lot, which was the way I grew up. We did all the time. We, uh, we didn't say God. As we still much. were up until a couple of years before we left. We still use that frequently in right. our marriage. Because in Mormonism, like saying Heavenly Father is just, it's respectful. And so I saw people complaining about it as though like, well, Mormons don't sit and say Heavenly Father all the time. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> like, we did. We did. That was... Um, I don't know. I don't know how you viewed it, but when I was a Mormon, like that was the more like respectful and loving way to refer to God yeah. was by saying heavenly father. And the only so, time we really used the word God was like reading it in the scriptures. If you were referring to him, um, in conversation or something else, it was pretty much always heavenly father. Right. right? Like heavenly father has a plan for me. Yeah. There's a lot of things like that, that I noticed people complaining about like places like Twitter where I was like, no, that's definitely how I remember it being. Um, specifically like when I was a child, I grew up in the nineties and there is a scene in under the banner of heaven where they show a, a new family member being introduced. I guess at the time she's probably a girlfriend or fiance. Yeah. Um, um, to the, a big Mormon Utah family. And I connected with it a lot. It reminded me of my childhood of going up to my grandparents' house and having a big family gathering and having dinner with all of my aunts and uncles and cousins. And there's a ton of people. And the thing that was funny to me too, was that they even kind of alluded to like, somebody has a whole bunch of kids and all of the kids have the first letter <laughs> or their first letter of their name is the same. Yeah. And I have cousins just like that. And so when they were introducing and doing all of this stuff and you know, they act so strange sometimes and I can see that like in hindsight, yeah, that is kind of odd. Like almost overly friendly. Yeah. Like it's almost a little bit mechanical. They're in it's a programmed, like yeah, programmed, they're in a programmed utopia to yeah. them. Like 
that's the way they view everything. I saw people complaining about that scene in particular, and for me, I was like, that was one of the Spot most realistic on. scenes. Like that Spot was on. that took me back to being like six and seven years old, going to a family reunion, just meeting other families in my ward as a child, or even meeting your family yeah. was like that. That's <laughs> the way it was. There's a scene where um, Jeb talks to one of his daughters or both of his daughters about their baptism yeah. coming up and ooh, like it cringe oh it was so it was hard to watch because <laughs> it, it, it triggered me yeah. a lot of those like memories and feelings and when he's talking to her i'm pretty sure i remember he talks about your sins are all going to be washed away and like I, just the fact so that he proud was of saying you for making this choice this choice to be baptized um and all your sins like are going to be washed away i i felt really grossed out by that because we have an eight-year-old and i just am like sins <laughs> like he doesn't your sins he doesn't sin he's just a kid yeah it, it just i don't know it, it was hard to watch both as somebody who's been an eight-year-old being baptized into the church and also now a parent of an eight-year-old mm. and the sort of language that he used for his daughter, I was just like, I can't imagine saying that to my kid. Putting yourself back in that mind frame of when I was about to be baptized and the amount of like, I don't know, in the church it's always like, no, it is your choice. We don't push kids to do that, blah, blah, blah. But I think back and I can very vividly remember how this was just what was going to happen. Yeah. There was no, there was no choice. There was no. absolutely no choice at all. It's expected and you know that it's expected from the time you're old enough to talk. Like you, yeah, you learn just know what's going to happen and nothing otherwise is going to happen. You're gonna get baptized. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a choice at all. So I don't know, with with the whole like the way people talk and the way people act and stuff and people feeling like it wasn't accurate. The reality is that there are many different types of Mormons. There's gonna be Mormons that are very, very into it that are like close to fundamentalist, but not. No. There are fundamentalist Mormons, scary ones. And then there's people that are kind of just like neutral and you know, more moderate. Then there are also like progressive Mormons and Jack Mormons and people that, you know, only believe certain pieces. And so I feel like no matter how accurate it is, because for me, I feel like 95 to 99% accurate. There were some things yeah. that I felt like were a little bit corny, but for the most part, it represented. But not that, not yeah, it that wasn't much. that much, but like I felt for the most part, it represented my Mormon upbringing especially when I was a child yeah. um, and the way my grandparents act very much on point with that mm -hmm. but for other Mormons like it might not represent their upbringing and that's okay but like it's not meant to represent every single mm -hmm. Mormon it's this story you know even if the whole thing was written produced acted by directed by Mormons it wouldn't be exactly representative of everybody's experience in no. the church yeah. but I it's think they did a really good be. job yeah yeah, they did a fantastic, like, it's done so well. Yeah. It's one of, if not the only show I've seen so far that, like, really went in-depth on a lot of things that, like, I would recommend to people who have never been a member of the church to be like, go watch this and get a feel for how it is. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the sort of plunge into the fundamentalism. How did you view polygamists and like offshoots of the Mormon church when you were a member. I didn't even know about it for like a really, really long time. Really? Like probably longer than I should have. Yeah, like right before my mission, I wanna say, within the first, within a few years before my mission probably. And I just remember viewing it as like completely 100% evil, off the deep really? end, incorrect, wrong. That's interesting. I um, wonder, I mean, I grew up in Utah, so I took like Utah history and I lived where most of the polygamists live. So yeah. I heard about it much younger and I don't think I, I really thought of it as like evil. I just thought they were like misled. Like we are the true church and they're getting it wrong because they're like following the wrong prophet. Basically. That's kind of the way we'd like when I was on my mission, that's the way we'd give it to investigators when they'd ask. Yeah. But I always thought of it as like, ugh. Since leaving the church, I feel like I've learned a lot more about polygamy and the FLDS church and all of those little other offshoots, more than I ever knew when I was a member. And, 
you know, through watching like these documentaries and hearing people speak about it, hearing people who have left speak about it, I personally felt like a lot of sympathy for them and I felt like I could relate a lot to the kinds of things they were saying because like the reality is they are different religions but they're based off the same religion and mm -hmm. so the early prophets that they still continue to believe in I mean all of the like early stuff and stuff that they focus on like we focused on a lot of that stuff too yeah. um, the way they feel about Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and everything and anyway though it was very interesting to see the Lafferty's starting to feel like well, why don't we follow this teaching that the early yeah. prophets said? Because once you know about it, it's like there is always going to be a divide. Do you continue on with regular old Mormonism or do you go FLDS, RLDS, or, or do you leave? And those are kind of the options. <laughs> once you do all that research, there's kind of no, I mean, you have to make a split decision. Once you learn all of that information and, you know, for us, like, when we started reading more about it and we found out we were like oh okay so it's it not true hokey. yeah like <laughs> and we decided to leave but it was interesting to see the other side of that where they were like they doubled down yeah and the kind of like crazy and kind of scary thing about seeing that happen on the screen in front of you is realizing that that actually happened yep. and, and that it could. still happens there are people, you might see them if you're on Twitter, a lot of them call themselves Desnat, where they are, they double down on the bad teachings, on the stuff that a lot of Mormons are like, mm, not so much. We don't have to believe every single thing a prophet's ever said, you or know. I shouldn't go around blood atoning people. Right. <laughs> But, and then there's people though that like will hide behind a fake screen name and a fake picture and advocate for those old teachings that most Mormons view as like, oh, that's not like something he said as a prophet. That's something he said as a man. And I, I, I don't know, personally, I, I was creeped out by it. I found yeah. it really scary. It was terrifying. I also really wanted to talk about Jeb's experience going from a true believing Mormon, somebody who's obviously very dedicated to learning more of these things, having his eyes opened to the reality of the way that church history actually was and how it's been whitewashed by church leaders. Um, and then even seeing him have to deal with his personal leaders trying to be like, D you don't need to talk about that. Like, trying to shut him down. Just, you know, calm down about that. We don't, that's in the past. We don't talk about the past. It was an emotional journey because it was like, oh, like all these emotions that he's going through, like been there. Yep. The scene where he like breaks down in his car in his garage and is just sobbing. And his wife pretty much makes it clear that they're done unless he, that he has to essentially live. I mean, he decides to go back and fake it the rest of the time, but yeah. live the rest of his life knowing it's hogwash. And having been somebody that's been in that position of like finding all this stuff out and then having that emotional breakdown because you feel like you're gonna lose everything if you leave. Oh, it was rough. It was, <laughs> that was actually probably my favorite part though because I felt like it was so well done and it so well represented the way it feels and how you feel like you're in between a rock and a hard place and there's no good decision to make because no, no matter what, it's like you feel like your life is gonna be terrible. And we weren't even, I mean, his situation was more problematic because we left together. And... Yeah, there was that like small point in time where I read all this information before you did and in between when I read it and when you got home from work, I'm going through all these scenarios because that's how a lot of Mormons are. If your partner is to leave, you cannot yeah. stay together because you have to have this eternal family and eternal marriage. And if your partner leaves, then what happens to your eternal family? What was your favorite part of the series? I don't know, I like the whole uh, mystery intrigue part of it the most, I think. Just them finding new clues and leading, it would lead them to new places or whatever. I just, that's kind of, we watch a lot of true crime stuff and that's what I find the most fascinating. But the fact that it was incorporated with very relatable personal touch, I mean, yeah. made it very addicting to watch. It was really cool. Let's also talk about the way that they depict Joseph Smith and Emma Smith oh, yeah. and all of that. I felt like it was really good. Pretty realistic. Uh, the part where Joseph basically like starts talking to Emma. And then gets revelation on the spot yeah. to basically tell her like, you gotta go with me or you're doomed. Yeah. That was very like, so I got well chills. Done. Yeah. 
I, I loved that it showed Emma as like not just going along with everything Joseph said because that's the way it was always portrayed to yes. us as the like Joseph and Emma were basically this like power couple that yeah, absolutely not <laughs> So it was really, really interesting to, I, I don't know, the way that they did it, I was like, this seems like it could be like really realistic. The power dynamic between the two of them, the way that she was fighting him on it, like it made her seem so powerful and so cool. And it made Joseph Smith seem like the skeezer that he is. Like, yeah. oh, it was nasty. But I, I also felt like it was pretty fair in other parts where, I mean, like it showed. No, it was fair all around. Like, yeah, when it showed him like getting dragged out to be tarred and feathered and stuff. And I mean, how horrifying that is. The way that the saints must have felt, the, the way they showed the children and you could see from every perspective. Yeah how this was just an awful situation all around and it really didn't feel like they took a biased standpoint on it from either side right because you could i mean i don't know there was mormons and, will disagree with that right but, but i mean like as a former mormon like when i learned about all the way the saints were persecuted and stuff i mean they were in a lot of ways you know not every single person that was persecuted was you know deserving right and it was sad and it was difficult to watch and it made you feel for them and the position that they were in, especially because for so many of them, most of them, I feel like this really was their deeply held beliefs. They were doing what they thought was the right thing. They were probably praying multiple times a day and getting feelings like this is the right path. I'm doing the right thing. Oh, and a lot of them are just following one guy. And yeah. back then it was probably a lot harder to tell that he was full of crap. The other part I thought was really interesting was the when they talked about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, which, very tragic. Oh, that was hard to watch. And, I mean, I don't even, I'm trying to remember what I knew about that as a member. I didn't know anything about it as a I member. I feel like I heard the name of the tragedy, but I didn't ever hear details. It just kind of was like Mountain Meadows Massacre got thrown around right. as like a... Like during Sunday school sometimes? Yeah, it was like a... We just assumed that it was a mass persecution of saints. I liked Detective Taba's character in that like, even though Jeb was a TBM and would like kind of view everything from that standpoint, Detective Taba kind of kept him balanced. And I think ultimately it, it probably helped lead to his open-mindedness when he read and yeah. found out actual church history. Yeah, he was he was a really great character. I love the way that they had him be. And he was never like mean to Jeb about stuff. Mm. Like if he ever said anything, it was like it was light hearted or yeah. teasing. But you could tell that they were really good friends. Yeah. And then especially at the end when it kind of shows him he like brings up to Jeb about his uh Native American history and stuff and those spiritual beliefs and different right. things and how he just kind of took bits and pieces from all these things and was like, yeah, they don't have any power, but... Yeah, and I, I love that when he talked about the song and, like, he was like, well, do you believe it? And he's like, no, I don't believe it has any power, but, like... You can still that acknowledge those things right. in your history. And he said, I still, like, what did he say? Like, I still sing it sometimes, or yeah. it's okay to still sing it sometimes. That was really beautiful to me, and it kind of reminded me of how, you know, a lot of Mormons when they find out that you've left the church, will be like, well, what would your ancestors say? Your pioneer ancestors. And it's like, well, I think that my pioneer ancestors would be proud that I broke away and did something that was scary for me, but I still felt like it was the right thing to do because that's what they did too, even yeah. if it was in a different way. Another thing, let's talk just a little bit about the temple scenes that they showed. A few parts where they were talking about Brenda learning the penalties, like the slitting your throat and splitting open your bowels. Then um, there was also the part where Brenda and all of the sisters-in-law are like in the endowment session, they're sort of whispering to each other. How did you feel about the way they portrayed the temple? It was spot on. As far as like the dress and the language and the... I felt like they were a little bit chattier than I ever was in there. Like we whispered a little bit, but I was scared to talk too much. It may have, it may have been more chatty back then than it is now. Maybe so. Everything else I thought was yeah. Like they nailed it. It came definitely from somebody who had been in there before. Yeah, it wasn't disrespectful in any way. Not like, at all. Just the like, mean I don't know. There's Mormons that would be upset because 
they showed the clothes oh know. no you know it's like the church has shown the clothes on their own website i don't think point, they so. even showed the any of the signs and tokens did they they did i think a little bit it wasn't like but here it wasn't, are each of them there was nothing made light about it there was nothing disrespectful about it there was nothing like slamming it I thought, I thought it was really good and i know that mormons are obviously going to be upset and offended because they yep. showed you know that what it looks like inside of a temple and what the people dress like but Honestly, like that stuff is starting to just become common knowledge. You can go to a temple walk through. Yeah. So they so you can be mad see what it looks that. like. You can also go on the church's website and they have pictures of what the clothing looks like on the website at this point. A little bit more about the Lafferty brothers and the way that they were delving into fundamentalism. I know members personally that are more that way. They're not fundamentalists. They obviously are not at that level. They're not violent or aggressive, but there's certain things like their hatred of the government, their hatred of taxes, um, that I, I know people personally, I'm related to people who have a lot of those same ideas and feel like any taxation whatsoever is theft. There were people that I've seen or met that were in all phases of that decline. Right. I mean, except obviously the like very Murdering. extremes. Yeah. <laughs> This is not just a problem with Mormonism either. This is something that you see in every religion because there's always going to be somebody who takes everything that they see, like even in the Bible, as like written in stone, literal. absolutely must follow, very literal. And I mean, that's why there are so many atrocities committed in the name of religion. I think it's interesting not only for people who have a connection to Mormonism in some way, but for other people too. I feel like this is something that you will see happen in any religion where somebody is incredibly pious and like yeah. overly zealous about their religion. Um, it's a thing that can happen, which is scary. <laughs> So all in all, like highly recommend it. I think it was great. There were a lot of really great parts. If you were ever a member of the church, there are parts that you were going to relate to. Um, and you know, I feel like if you were not as devout of a Mormon, you were more of like a Jack Mormon, uh, or you grew up outside of Utah, or you grew up in the church in a different time period, like a, you know, if you were younger, I feel like it's a great way to get a look into how it was in really devout Mormon families, yeah. because that was very on point for my Mormon upbringing. The only other thing I would want to bring up is the part where um, Dan and Ron both are like basically fighting for being the prophet, which is something I had never thought about before leaving the church, but is like, it really hit home once I did leave and start researching is like, the when you have two different people receiving their personal revelation, which is just their own inner thoughts, they start conflicting and how they showed and talked about there could only be one and then one of the brothers ended up trying to kill the other was just yeah. like, yeah, that's how it that would go down. That actually happened as well, but it was after they were arrested and they were in prison together. Yeah. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to mention was the women in that situation and the way they were treated Ugh. and how the men justified it using Religion, scripture yeah. and using doctrine from the church. So I've done bad. videos before talking about the things that leaders have said about women, the way that women have been treated in the church. And honestly, the Lafferty's were using actual scripture, actual doctrine, actual words of prophets to justify the way that they were treating the women. Horrible. Yeah, it was absolutely awful and it was hard to see, but it was like, this is why those kinds of things are wrong because there are Mormons that see, you know, oh yeah, that, I don't like what that prophet said or whatever. And then they just, oh yeah, but like, he was just speaking as a man. But when you really look at Mormon doctrine, a prophet, I've done videos about this before too. The Mormon church has taught that a prophet is God's mouthpiece upon the earth and he things won't he lead says, you astray. yeah, he will not lead you astray. And what he says is as good as scripture. So if you get a Mormon that really truly believes what the church has taught, they're also going to believe that everything the prophet says is scripture. It's just as important. And in fact, um, it was Ezra Taft Benson that said that what a living prophet says is more important yeah. than scripture. It becomes even more dangerous because you factor in all these 
contradictions and things, and they, instead of using logic to reason their way out of that, they just take it all in and it jumbles up your headspace. Right. Until you continue to fall and fall and fall to that point where Ron and Dan went to, because you've you've got so mixed up up in your head that <sighs> it's terrifying. It is. All in all, highly recommend it. Think it was great. I think everybody should watch it. Mormon, non-Mormon, never Mormon. All right, well, that'll be it for us today. Thank you for watching. Uh, let us know what you thought of Under the Banner of Heaven in the comments. Let us know what your favorite parts were, whether it's like similar to what we liked about it. And of course, big thank you to my patrons for helping support the channel. You guys are the best. Extra special thank you to AA, Craig Call, Doug Davis, Mormonland to the Guiltiest Place on Earth, Jason Wilkins, Noble Monster Comics, Richard Kaner, Tans, and the Exmo Candle Company for supporting at the Demon Tier on my Patreon. If you would like to support the channel, you can find links to do so in the description below, as well as links to all my other social media if you want to see more content. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Brendan, for being here. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Never revealing no secrets you're keeping These promises strong as a spell I'll never tell Yeah, I like you, that's for sure